You're watching Deprogrammed. This is the New Culture Forum's latest show, committed to fighting back against the forces of ideological conformity, particularly among the young. My name's Harrison Pitt, I'm a senior editor at the European Conservative, and I'm thrilled to be joined today, as ever, by Evan Riggs, who is a freelance journalist, and our special guest this week, William Clouston, leader of the Social Democratic Party and a very good friend of the New Culture Forum channel. Now, um, William, what do you think the fate of the Red Wall is in 2024. Can the STP, whose worldview is more in line with the realignment promise to Northern voters in 2019, encourage many of the new Conservative intake from that year perhaps to defect to your own party? Yeah, I think as a, a party of the Conservative left, the STP lands right on top of the Red Wall. So if, if there were any justice in the world, and if we were better known, and if there was a blind uh, sort of Pepsi taste of us, we would win all those seats. Uh, the, mm. In the elections that we contest in these areas, uh, the more people find out about us, the more they like us and we've got their backs. And um, so our, our, our position, the SDP's position, is different to all other parties in those red wall seats in that the more the public find out about us, the more they vote for us. The other parties are the opposite, so they have to conceal their lack of patriotism or their sort of dodginess or their, far, you know, their, their weird views on economics. Um, or in the Labour Party's case, their sort of woke uh, uh, opinions. So they try to conceal them, but I think the public's got it. I think our main challenge as a party is that we're quite small and we're still growing. And the, in the next election, 2024, is very interesting to us. And we, we should have 120 candidates, something like that, which is a lot for us, a big, big uh, jump from last time. Um, and we'll do as well as we can. We've, we've got a, an electoral pact in South Yorkshire, which is an interesting thing with Reform UK. Um, We've got, it's a very limited electoral pact. It's just South Yorkshire, we're fighting it together. Sure. And then there's six seats nationally where we don't stand against each other. I see. So there's some target seats. So, yeah, I'm very excited about it. And uh, the Red Wall is, is, it was a unique opportunity for the Tories, which they, for lots of reasons, technical reasons, really, ideological reasons, they couldn't uh, embrace and, uh, and, and rotate to. Hmm. Uh, is being a party <coughs> of the conservative left not a bit of an oxymoron? And would it... Why wouldn't it be right for then someone to say that you are a party of the, what you might call like the liberal right? How would you break that down? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, conservative left, no, not at all, because our basic uh, philosophical position now is that we are, I guess, reacting to double liberalism, um, waves of, of, of social liberalism and economic liberalism at the same time. So mm. the, the public, in most, a lot of Western countries have had it from both ends, really. And I don't think there's anything socially conservative or family friendly, for instance, in the type of uh, new right uh, free trade purism that we've had. Uh, in fact, it's obvious to anyone that looks at it, um, the United States or here, the post-industrial towns have, have been basically put on the scrap heap by a type of economics which prioritizes short-term uh, gain but doesn't understand anything about the foundations of a normal town. I mean, there's industrial towns, I could say, you know, Pittsburgh or Cleveland, Ohio, or Middlesbrough or, or Newcastle for that matter. Uh, the foundation of those towns was the industrial wage. The foundation of family life was the industrial wage. <clears throat> Yet we've been governed by people that, both at corporate level and at uh, national level, who are completely indifferent to what is made where and by whom, even if it's made by slaves in the Far East, close the factories down, ship the jobs out to Southeast Asia, and as a result you have, you've replaced productivity essentially with uh, deaths of despair and opioid epidemics and, and tragedy. And I think that's the, that's the base case of the SDP's position on economics. Um, it's 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 realm based, you know. I don't want the state. I don't want a big state necessarily. I want an effective mm. state at doing what the state should do, and I want the private sector to absolutely go for it in terms of innovation mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 properly functioning markets. That's that's how it works. It seems to me that the yeah, I I, I would broadly speaking agree with that. It seems to me that the main uh, raison d'etre of your form of le the left in your left conservative mm. formula is precisely that. It's an, it's an understanding that the invisible hand doesn't always equal justice, particularly in its globalized form. Yes. And, there's, and there's also a, a, an objection to this, the, the, the simple-minded li liberal construction of human beings, or the liberal belief about what human beings fundamentally are, a sort mm. of profit-maximizing consumer. Econ. Econ. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. 
um, profit maximizing consumers whereas yes. of course as you say that the foundations of a town it's not just that you want your groceries in the store to be cheaper which they often will be under mm. a free trade model mm. you also want to have a hand in producing what's going into that store you, you want to feel as though you're you're, you're you're not just some kind of idle consumer but that let's just dig down a little bit deeper so it, people say cheaper yes uh, the monetary price of something mm. might be cheaper but what you're arguing for is actually very very expensive so to have your um, to have your shelves and your drawers full of clutter uh, cheap tat imported from abroad, mm -hmm. but to destroy your industrial base mm. is not cheap. Indeed. You may get the, the you get the uh, goods cheap, and uh, you go to any any tip in the UK or the States, you'll see a lot of a lot of waste. But it's not cheap; it's very expensive, and the sort of Thatcherite economics that we've had um, has defeated itself. It's literally self-defeating mm. in terms of the social costs, breakdown of the family, breakdown of those uh, industrial areas. The cost of keeping those industrial areas just afloat mm -hmm. now is so high, it, it could never have been worth, worth mm -hmm. it to, to negate and close down all the industries. And again, I, it often best to talk in detail. This country started uh, the a nuclear industry in the 50s. It was a pioneer. And <clears throat> the Tories got in uh, to power in 2010 and closed down British nuclear fuels deliberately closed it down, and four years later they're going off to the Chinese and saying, could you build us a mm. nuclear power station? Yeah, could you do it? This is the sort of indifference that I'm talking about. It, it's disgraceful. And, and it, has no, it has no conception of uh, place, and it has no conception of nation state, and it has no conception of patriotism. It's or, just or, or, sorry, William, but I was going to say, or posterity either, because Nothing. on the nuclear question, yeah. that there are there are literal quotes of people like and Nick Clegg, who has said, even mm. though he's not complete right wing, but he's, <coughs> he's sort of economically liberal, and that's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking. That's about. what we're talking about here. Saying, gosh, well, well, there's no point in having investing nuclear power because it won't come online for 20 years. Yes. Here we are, 20 years later, we could probably do with some, and yet that's exactly what. It's there's very a sort expensive. of short termism. It's very, very expensive. expensive. This sort of attitude, say. desperately, desperately expensive, and. So you, you you know industry after industry after industry, British mm -hmm. governments and, and American governments have just let those industries go, and uh, it's based on it's based it's it's ideological because we've educated post-war we educated a generation who were just brought up on Hayek and uh, Friedman, and they're ideological. I mean they, they they if it if it destroys your industrial base, so be it. Mm. You know if it goes to China, so be it. If it destroys your country, if if it makes your country totally lack resilience to economic shocks so be it, it's fine because because we've got cheaper goods but again i'll maintain on the on the economics it's not even economics some of it just counting up it fails because i look at i talk about trade a lot i'm the only, but i think the only british politician that does um and this indifference to your trade gap the united states massive mm. trade gap you just mm. uh, ma we've got a massive trade gap three percent of gdp uh you know it can be up up at 120 billion a year and none of our cowardly politicians <coughs> are, well, mm. to be fair, a lot of them are too stupid to understand it. A lot of they don't understand the economics of international trade anyway, the basic metrics of it. But even those that do spout this stupid uh, sort of economic purist, free trade uh, purist idea uh, that it doesn't matter, you've got the goods. Well, no, it really does. Mm. And it does because if you can count, it does. Because you get poorer by the quantum of your your trade gap per year mm. and this country hasn't had a, uh, a, a, a positive trade in goods since since 1982 yeah, so we've accumulated huge amounts of debt. so how do you how do you correct that then how do you correct this malaise of uh, ignorance around trade and these economic issues that you're the only one talking about um, it's curious that it's not it, it, it's a cultural thing it, some, I in the 50s 60s 70s uh, politicians were aware of it. Uh, journalists talked about trade gaps, price of the pound, and so on, all the t literally all the time. And the quarterly trade deficit would be published, and it'd be front page news. It's just just off the agenda now. I think there are lots of reasons for that. I mean, and uh, how on earth you educate a, a new political class in this? Uh, I, I I don't know. I just start by talking about it. Basically, I mean, I, I talk about it at, at, um, at, uh, at you know conferences, and I bring it up in in, in interviews. Um, but it's very, very important because you can only pay for uh, imports in, in, in three ways, by exporting something or by selling something you already have or by issuing debt. Mm. And the, the second two will make you poorer. 
I mean, the Tories and the, you know, there's a think tank quite close to where we're speaking from would, would say, oh, you know, it's a, it's a vote of confidence. And I've, I've made this joke, you know, about a sort of crack addict uh, and, the, and the, you know, the dealer. But that is actually the truth of it. And, and as I say, it's not economic theory, it's not elaborate theory, it's just the ability to count up how much you're getting poorer each year should be on the political agenda but isn't. And it's, it shows a, a sort of lack of seriousness, I think. How you correct it, um, and, uh, you've got to want it. You've got to want, you've got a value industry, you've got to value uh, manufacturing, you've got to protect some of these industries. The successful industrial economies like Japan and South Korea would not sell their utilities to uh, foreign entities, would not strip their, mm. they would not sell their, their, uh, their best industrial companies. We've sold, we, we, you know, it doesn't work whether it's Jaguar or, 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 or Pilkington or, or um, Roundtree Macintosh or Cadbury's, you name it, uh, foreign takeover, oh yeah, you can have it, doesn't matter. Well, it, that means that you will never have a strong domestic industrial base if you have that attitude of just cashing in, short-term cashing in now. And it's cost us a lot. I, I, as I say, it, it, will, it will be on the agenda in the end because the, the end road for this stupidity is, literal, is like Argentina. Mm. You, you'll get to a stage uh, where, and I'm worried about the United States, big as it is, massive it is, influential as it is, debt to GDP, government, because there's debt in all three sectors, is, is now 123, 124%. It's beyond the event horizon. It probably can't come back. Mm. So whether it's, I want people to talk about it now, uh, and we, our green paper, End of Indifference, is all about debt. It's all about, you know, face up, don't, don't, don't pretend that this isn't here. It's a cultural problem, actually. Mm. That's, that's the issue. So I, I agree with, you know, you want to look 20 years ahead and start, you know, building the power plants that will, you know, keep <clears> your children warm or something. Yeah. Um, the long-termism there is very important, though yeah. it's easier said than done. Mm. But what would be some potential short-term solutions for this? Like, just try to buy back the companies, try to make Britain more appealing to people who might want to move their industry here? Yeah, you could buy the, I mean, our policy is to nationalize the, the railways and utilities, and everyone says, well, how are you going to pay for it? Well, <clears throat> first, um, when I want to do something, even if it's quite modest, uh, people on the right will say, you can't do that, we haven't got the money. And then the pandemic comes along, we suddenly find 500 billion. Oh, it's interesting, <laughs> when, to do something, right. when you want to do something, you can do it. So I said, the first, the first thing is wanting to do it. Th things like railways is very, very cheap. I mean, the, the heavy lifting is done by the state now anyway, so the, the franchise can be brought back in, you could have a well-planned national system, finally. Uh, but I'd go further, you've got to get back a commitment to making the rolling stock and uh, locomotives here. And you, know, you have a little bit of train production, <coughs> but it's foreign owned. Uh, it shouldn't be foreign owned, it should be uh, British and it should mm -hmm. be based but you know, probably back at Crewe in Swindon where it was uh, uh, started. Um, but, so you've got to want to do it. On the utilities, uh, buy them back. Uh, if necessary, issue a separate bond that mm. the, the public can buy to buy it back. You're not worse off if and only if you haven't paid too much for it. On a balance sheet basis, I think if you buy something that's worth <coughs> X billion and you don't pay more than X billion, you've, you've exchanged something for it, you're not worse off. Uh, and that would at least stop some of what I'm talking about, which is the siphoning off of, uh, of dividends abroad constantly. It's like a drip, drip, drip. Again, mm -hmm. which is about, it's on the balance of payments that year. Yes. You, 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 you turn your tap on in London, you're paying tax. You know, it's just going out. Yes. So, and again, no, <coughs> no state, no sensible state. And by the way, no sensible uh, group of politicians would allow this. They, the people that allow it uh, are just spivs. I just call them spit. <laughs> Do you, um, this is interesting though, because what everyone was saying just then about how um, one, one way around this, on, on, in policy terms, oh, yeah, you need to want to do it, but in policy yeah. terms, one way around this would be to try and make it more uh, it, it appealing for people to do onshore manufacturing here. Mm. Does that mean that your um, rather left-wing patriotic pr yeah. protectionism yeah. can actually go hand in hand with a rather liberalizing attitude on the red tape front? Oh yeah, sure. You do. I mean, you, you, you know, this is the, the STB social market thing, which, which incidentally, I, I, I was very privileged to give a paper at Liverpool University recently with on the David Owen, My Life is Politics Day, and Politics Day, and it was on the social market. And the social market, we, are, we as a party, we've always been, I'd argue, more market orientated than any other party for the market. Mm. So, you know, again, we've had governments that have let, com you know, a lot of markets are cartelized. A lot of them are dominated by big players. Tech is the obvious example, but it's not just that distribution, <coughs> some manufacturing. And, you know, big money gets into it, whether it's at the EU in Brussels or, or whether 
it's uh, you know in Washington or London, and these these cartels are allowed to function. We're dead against that. You want proper competition in the market, and most of the economy is ordinary goods and services and, uh, is produced by by the market. Mm -hmm. You want it to be as efficient as possible. You don't want red tape getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on, just on the specifics of industry, how you do it, you, you've, got to, you've got to want to do it, but you've also got to provide, you've got to start training people. Because if you put a, an, a particularly in manufacturing, which is the quickest way to get productivity up, I mean, you know, that, did you know, technically, you can, you can ramp up productivity in manufacturing rapidly in a way that you can't do with services. It's just one of the, thing, one of the features okay. of it. But you've, you know, you've got to train people, give, the, give, the, give them the skills uh, to, to do it, and not just have this, again, this open... Uh, idea just import econs. You know, you sure let's not bother training anyone, let's just drop them in from Indeed. here, there, and everywhere. It's just off, off, often stupid. Often skimming off the elites of the, of, the third, <coughs> of the third world in order to do that sort of thing as well, which, yeah, you know, had humanitarian, it's humanitarianly fraught to put to, to, to fraught. <laughs> yeah, you're, well, if you're talking about, yeah, if you're talking about uh, medics from West Africa, it's exactly. utterly immoral, yes, to do this, but but that's a separate thing. But and then you've got to just get your, your ducks in a row. You know, mm. you've got. I mean, there's no industrial economy. An industrial economy needs cheap and reliable base load power. Sure. And for me, that would be nuclear. And we've got Rolls Royce, who's got these SMRs. And you know, I, I would, I've, I've constantly backed them. We've constantly backed them as a party. They should have built them on the existing sites that we've got now. You know, there are nuclear power stations all over that. Just extend them. Plonk and you, you know, or, and if necessary, a few of them you could do three or four at once because you need three or four to get up to size well. Just, just get your shoulder behind it. Uh, they don't do it. There's no. And, and the Tories the other day were talking. This is how ludicrous they are. They're talking about um, giving a contract to Rolls Royce for these SMRs, but getting a French company or someone else to bid again. No, come on. This, yeah. The time is over for yeah. this sort of thing. You've just got to do it. And actually, the Brexit freedoms that we would talk about. As, as Lexiters are all about industrial policy. It's all about the ability to say, we're going to do it this way. Don't like it, bye. You know, yes. You've got the power. So that was, that was what it was about for us. Um, but I never, I never, on all the specifics of training and, and power, sites, uh, development, and s deciding which sectors to go for, or even uh, a little bit of protectionism, which I've argued for in the past, um, which everyone thinks is, is shockingly bad. Yes. I, I, <laughs> I did an interview. Do you remember? Um, do you remember when Theresa May was going through a sort of no deal stage, and we didn't? Yes. And I, Paddy O'Flynn, and I were doing quite a few interviews, and I, I did one. And I said, oh, I don't want a deal at the moment. It's <laughs> not worth yeah. having it. Just get out without a deal, and then you know, make your own yes. way in the world. And they say, yeah, but it would be bad for trade. I said, well, we've got a, a trade deficit with the EU of 80, 80 billion. It's mm. our biggest, most problematic trading partner. And I said, I want some friction. Mm. What? You know, because it would reduce really? the deficit. Yeah, yes, yes. yeah, obviously. The trade uh, deficit, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it reduced the trade deficit, and uh, and and so they just couldn't get their heads around this. Mm. We're so we're so sort of marinated in mm. this idea that it's just cheap goods and supermarkets. Well, I think I think it has a huge amount to do with the fact that nations aren't really considered as anything. Nations. Uh, they are, yeah, they, well, they aren't really considered as, 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 as collective with, it, with common good interests of their own. No. They, they are like big individuals. And in the same way that, I mean, I don't, I'm sure you would agree with me, there's nothing wrong with running a trade deficit with your local bookshop. I mean, you're going to do that, and both parties benefit from that. I certainly run a trade deficit with my lo local bookshop. Uh, but when, but uh, once you sort of, that, that doesn't sort of, what's the word, doesn't scale up on a national scale because there are all these other externalities to do with people's sense of the, 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 contrib the contributions they're able to mm. make to their community, um, which matter as well a great deal. And it, it seems to be difficult to get people to understand this. Yeah, I don't, I think the, I mean, you know, one of the fallacies in economics is that you, you know, and, and politicians use it quite a lot, but they, they, they the ones that use it either <coughs> don't understand it or they're being disingenuous, that you know, the government isn't a, isn't a, isn't a, a household, it isn't a mm. person. Hmm. Uh, you know, because fiscal drag and other things, you can run a you can run a f physical deficit, and and your GDP that GDP can go down actually. So you know, I get that totally. But uh, you know, the fact remains: as a nation state, if you constantly run these, you will get poorer. You will at the end of the year, you will owe more and own less. Hmm. And it's as simple as that. That is actually on the on the accounting. It's not any theory. It's just and your communities will be <coughs> particularly if they were dependent upon that. They will be hollowed out as a result. You're getting poorer. Hmm. Slowly but surely, and the states that are good at the op the opposite of us, like Singapore, look at go to Singapore. What? <laughs> he's, he's he's a fanatical fan. I knew that was Singapore. coming actually. Fanatical fan of Singapore. Bring Singapore every other episode. Yeah, well, I do. We do. We do. We, do. we actually someone said the best bit of journalism after the SB conference was uh, 
was they said, well, what, is, what is the SDP? And it's like a cross between Blue Labour and Singapore. Yeah, it's true. I mean, mm. uh, a massive family. We've got family links that go all the way back. And, uh, you know, as a kid, I used to go a lot. My dad used to have a, an office on Boki. Mm. And, yeah, but, but he, you know, just look at what... He's, he is the, the statesman, the world statesman, Lee Kuan Yew. He's, he's achieved the most. <laughs> Lee, Kuan, Lee Kuan Yew. Yeah. Lee Kuan Yew. For, yeah, for, from, from nothing to everything. But, it, but a lot from of... Third world to first. Yeah, brilliant book. And, and, and Go King Sui, all the people... I mean, Go King Sui, I think, on the housing side was phenomenal. Again, mm-hmm. I think they're, they're just... They've done brilliantly. Mm. But a lot of it, if you stand back from it, it's just... It's compound interest on on mm-hmm. on sur- constant surpluses and Temasek investing properly and taking a long term view and also knowing what you're doing. I mean, mm. they, they. But actually, I, I again, I would defend it absolutely as the best implemented version of the SDP social market because, and I said so in Liverpool three weeks ago. Uh, pity we didn't do it. But you've got social housing, you know, for particular reasons. I can see why the state would have to have a hand mm. in that crowded island. But but you know, eighty percent of Singaporeans live in social mm. housing. First rate uh, uh, transport infrastructure, you know, and the state's not scared, as everyone knows, of saying it's going to be like this. Mm. You know, so, so you know, I, I, on something like the migrant crisis in this country, which is an utter shambles, and we are getting, I'm, you know, I'm a, th- a Cold War kid, I'm old enough to remember the Berlin Wall, and you know, people press at it, and then it goes down, and then it just, you know, just you're open. Now, that was a good thing, but I see in the West, you know, the Mexican border with the United States, and and our border to some extent, they're pushing and pushing and pushing. If you if you understand anything about human nature at all, at one point that could just it's gone, and then we just you you, you know the United States is done it, but anyone who wants to rock up. So on, on on the topic of Singapore, you might have seen this on Twitter the last few days. Mm. It was like this viral post that went off, and it was like some tech guy who said like the ultimate culture shock coming to Singapore and seeing someone leave a fifteen thousand dollar bike yeah, so out that. in the open unlocked. And, sure. you know, it's, I mean, there, there's no sort of first principle reason that London couldn't be like this. Well, it was like that. Yeah. So, or be like that again. So what would be the SDP's um, sort of plan of action to get us back to that state? It's perfectly possible. You know, you're obviously aware of, of, of I don't know if it's in f- uh, third world to first, but it's a, w- it's a well-known uh, account of Lee Kuan Yew. I think it was 1948 he was over, wasn't he? And he comes out of, have you heard this Piccadilly Circus thing? Yes, the story about yeah, him yeah, seeing yeah, the yeah. newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's a culture with high, tr- you know, so you've got it. Well, our viewers might not be aware of the story, so why don't oh, you well, tell okay, well, Lee Kuan Yew is a very young man. He's a, 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 a law student, wasn't he? And um, and he's on the left, he's a man on the left, you know, he's a member of the Labour Party at the time, uh, equivalent. And he saw this newspaper seller who'd gone uh, to the loo. Mm-hmm. And he left a pile of uh, newspapers with the, with the money, the tin with the money, and it's just leaving money. And of course, Londoners were just leaving their money. Uh, that's fine, obviously. And, and there's high social trust, and uh, uh, and in that society, that anyway, he he wrote about it and said, "This is a culture. Mm-hmm. This is a this is civilization. This is civilization." Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he's right. Yeah. Um, how you get how you get to Singapore from here? Uh, you just have to be more like Singapore. You have to say, <laughs> you basically, you have to, you have the to. Gains out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's 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 tough, but you have to take crime seriously. There has to be a consequence for committing crime, and, and there isn't. I mean, on on you mentioned the bike in Singapore. Uh, you know, uh, bike crime in this city is is, is legalized. I mean, it, you know, it just doesn't get mm. the way. And, and uh, partly, it's it's like when the dam is broken, mm. the police don't have time to. You know, if you know any family members that have been victims of this, or even you know, uh, theft of credit cards, they, they didn't have time. They're not because the weight of criminality is so great. So it's not a brilliant position to start from. But all everything mm. I see is is a government that lacks the will to be serious about crime mm. and to take and to punish people as well. I mean, you know, again, Patrick O'Flynn and I have argued for for years on this that there's a role for probably the prime role for prisoners to, is incarceration. It's literally keeping criminals away from hurting mm. people, stealing people, attacking people or whatever. And people say prison doesn't work. And I say, well, yes, of course it does. Because it works for the period of time the criminal is in the mm, yeah. prison, obviously. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think you've, you've got to... But the, I still think the, 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 the fundamental thing that's happened in Britain and a lot of the West is, is disintegration of the family. I think family disintegration is a sort of alpha and omega of all these things. And until you get politicians willing to speak up for the traditional family, willing to have some policies that back the married family, even which is people think, oh, that's a bit edgy, but the SCP mm. does it. 
uh, and it's not to disparage people that are single parents at all. It's just to go, just to be honest, and not cowardly about the data. Yeah. So Lee Kuan Yew said, um, <coughs> I think at Harvard actually, to a group of highly educated Harvard people, um, that if he could kill drug dealers a hundred times, he would, mm. because they destroy entire families. Mm. And Singapore famously will hang you if you fly into their airport with like That's a couple of on the landing card. Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you just said, you know, that the solution would be to be more like Singapore. The question would be, how much? I mean, are we mm. talking about caning art vandals? Are we talking about? I think in Singapore, if you overstay your visa by three days, mm. they cane you and then they put you in jail and then they deport you, mm. which is pretty intense. Yeah, it's pretty How intense. close would you get? I don't. I, I think. I think this is where you get into realism. You can, you can admire what Singaporeans have done, and, lo, and let's be honest as well. A lot of what they've done, the eighty uh, percent Chinese population of Singapore, uh, and their very strict integration rules. Uh, were accepted by a population at that time in that space were, were agreeable to it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when, when politicians and academics even start saying, uh, well, that, that's a nice policy, I'll just have that, and that's, where's that? Oh, that's a, it's over in X. Oh, we'll just drop it in, drop it in. And it, th that's not realistic a lot of the time because a lot of, uh, in economics and social fields, a lot of policies are not transportable. But the conditions, the conditions on the ground matter, and if, exactly. they, and if they vary, then the template doesn't work. Yeah, and, they, mm. and also they, they went from ground up in the place they were. Mm. So it's very difficult. But I, to be more like, you, you just have to be more sensible on all these things, you know, and, and I, I, you know, the, I mentioned the border a lot, you know, and then we say what would Lee Kuan Yew do a lot, but if Lee Kuan Yew were in charge in 2019, when, the, when people started coming in, he just stopped it immediately. Mm -hmm. and, and if he stopped it immediately, and we know how to, it's quite a simple it wouldn't exist. <laughs> people wouldn't do it because people respond to incentives. People who are cautious about going too far in an authoritarian direction as well should probably yeah. bear in mind where we might be in 20 years' time if these trends continue. Because it's been well understood in political yeah. philosophy for many, many centuries that high trust societies are just much better place to mm. be governed with a light touch because what you ideally want to have, like, you can only really have like Robert Nozick's night watchman state when uh, which is incredibly libertarian, just let mm. people, lets people do what they're doing. And it, when, when that state is tasked with stepping in to the exceptions to, civil, yes. to civilised behaviour. Exactly. But if uncivilised behaviour is the norm, then you're in a situation where in order to maintain social order, the night watchman state becomes... Wishful a, thinking. The, the yeah. night watchman state becomes an omnipresent invigilator, and it has to do that. And For so sure. the sooner you adopt some, some Singaporean tactics on this sort of question, the less likely you will have to adopt Chinese ones in 40 years. But there, mm. but there, is, a, but there is a desire and there's a clarity in Singaporean policy and they, they get it. And, and again, he makes the point in the book uh, quite a few times where, uh, particularly in the early days, in the mid-60s or late-60s, where surrounded with regional partners that were a little bit hostile to, mm. to Singapore. And there's a famous case, I think it was Indonesian uh, uh, criminals that, you know, uh, Lee Kuan Yew hung. And he did it to say, well, we're, what goes on here? I mean, I'm against the death penalty personally, but the, but he did it to demonstrate, and the, everyone picked it up. It's okay. Well, this is a serious person, serious state, and uh, what goes on in Singapore is the man of the Singaporean. <laughs> uh, you know, and it's a very interesting chapter. That it's a very interesting chapter. So yeah, you've got to be realistic. But you, yeah, we 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 are really quite appallingly governed. And actually, the long, the long, <laughs> you won't much disagree. No, you won't. No, it's shocking about that. And, I, and, 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 and no, honestly, and I think you know, people say, well, "Why do you do things?" Well, and I, I love, I love NCF, and I love think tanks, and I love uh, thinkers and writers, and and all of that's brilliant. But ultimately, there's a huge, great gap where we are mm. in politics. And the rational thing to do is to build a political entity that contests elections, get get seats, Absolutely. and get people elected. Taking a, a bit of a left turn here and going from authoritarian to libertarian. What do you make of <coughs> Javier Mille, who's the new president of Argentina, saying that the Falklands belong to Argentina? Yeah, they all say that, yeah. Um, no, know, but I think he's pretty serious I'd about it. Surprised, I'd be well, surprised if he called it the Falklands as well. Yeah, yeah what is Malvinas. He called? Las Malvinas. No, okay. Malvinas, yeah. Well, it's, 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 it, to use English uh, understatement, it's not helpful. Mm. <laughs> mm. Not helpful. Uh, they, it tends to be a barometer of, uh, of Argentinian... Um, tension, political mm. tension, because when Argentinian governments get into trouble, they tend to pick a fight on this. Mm -hmm. But it was very, very interesting listening to uh, David Owen at the Liverpool thing three weeks ago, because he was Foreign Secretary immediately prior to the uh, Thatcher period when Carrington got in. And he, he talked about the Falklands, actually. He was an expert, um, did a paper on yeah. it. And he kept, he was fully aware 
yeah. uh, that this was a problem and they could they could they could try it on, and they kept, they had this uh, ship HMS Endurance, which he deliberately kept on extended to show the Argentinians that he meant business, and I think there was even talk at some stages where they would um, leak deliberately the idea that there were nuclear powered submarines in the mm. in the area patrolling just to just to make the point. Mm. Uh, and the Labour government actually is an underrated government, the Callaghan government, lots of problems, lots of challenges. Uh, but they, you know, the Argentinians didn't invade at the time and then the Tories got in, scrapped endurance, sent the wrong message and the invasion mm. occurs. So, um, As you say, the, the military junta, which was then in existence in Argentina, was also looking for a pretext to, uh, to bolster its legitimacy, which it was, of it, which it was, and that's what authoritarian, ultra-authoritarian regimes mm. do, like when when the economic prosperity isn't mm. going as it might, they national, 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 it's a distraction tactic. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm, but, I'm, but I have to confess, I don't, I've read a little bit about this, this new leader in Argentina, I can't pretend to be an expert um, in him at all, it seems... Uh, interesting. He's certainly I'm very fine. Yeah. He's certainly an eccentric figure. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he'd agree with your. I mean, he, he. I don't think he'd agree with your patriotic form of protectionism. He wants to like dollarize the Argentinian economy and all, yes, that, sort of, and yes. all that sort of thing. Well, again, horses are courses. I Indeed, don't, I, yeah. I, I think uh, a final international question. This one much closer to home. Speaking of eccentric figures, what do you make of what's gone on in Ireland recently? And Conor McGregor posting. Uh, I think it was yesterday, uh, Ireland, your new president. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ireland's, I mean, what happened, what happened in Ireland recently has been, um, is sadly reminiscent of, of what happens throughout a lot of the West, which is that an outrage occurs mm. and <clears throat> the cultural establishment, in this case, the press, particularly the broadcast media, mm -hmm. uh, try and treat the public as children and pretend that they can conceal, say in this case, the original identity of the, the, the knife attacker uh, of school children. And um, that's like, it's always, you know, if you have a bit of film, you know, a bit of plastic film and there's an air bubble and you, you press it and mm. it goes somewhere else. That's what it's like, it's foolish, you can't do that. But they, but we, they do it here, I mean they do it, or France, you know, recently a young 16 year old was killed, very little mainstream broadcast press attention of it and so people turn to social media and uh, and it sort of escalates but I think the if you had a I mean the political class in, in Ireland seems Varadka and his cohorts seem to be completely in denial and um, I've, I mean it's a cheap this is I mean I, I try and stay stay on the high ground but it's a tre cheap rhetorical point but I I, I always I, I've said met a few times that if if the politicians that let uh, open door, unfettered, uncontrolled, unchecked migration into the West paid the price in terms of the prison sentences that those, some of those people caused, you know, the crimes they caused, they might have a different view. But they don't take any responsibility for it. And so they, you get the open borders and you get the lax <coughs> um, mm. Um, conditions and then the public play, pay the price. It's also just so much easier in, at, at a time like that when you know you have a choice as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a politician within the establishment you can either you know uh, have a bit of a, a moment of recognition on the, the mm. folly of mass immigration without assimilation mm. or you can you know uh, or you can target the people who point it out and uh, I Ireland is currently in the process of beefing, beefing up its hate speech laws in order yeah, to course. fight the people who point out the problem rather than the, the people who are often the cause of the problem. But Harrison that is exactly the same that's, that's, that's the, that's the did, bubble yes. and it'll get, you know, you can't actually, you know, it is the disinfectant is the debate mm. you know, and, and they won't win on this in the end and particularly with the Irish who I think still have it's very interesting that, you know, uh, some of their established politicals, even uh, parties even there, mm. Republican ones, strong Republican ones have taken this liberal turn, the same liberal turn that all uh, other mainstream parties have taken. Uh, so it's not a, that that might be filled by uh, an MMA fighter. Yeah. It's, just, yeah. it's, it's, it's just hilarious. God, I hope so. It's, it's, it's just hilarious there how sort of yeah. that, that strong brand of Irish Celtic nationalism, which England has known only too well <laughs> over the last 200 years, Yes. Uh, all, all of a sudden becomes a kind of cosmopolitan international, uh, internationalism which turns the Irish people into its enemy. Mm. Yes, it's interesting. And, and actually, Irish history is interesting on this. Um, mm. A point Aris Rusinos makes, uh, may, has made recently. Um, at Dunhurst. Yeah. yeah, but I think more on, just on Twitter, you know, because oh. uh, he lives in Ireland now. But the, the, um, that people forget that early Republican theory and government was pretty right wing. 
and he says, you know, he argues that the Republic, the original sort of uh, Republican reaction against uh, British rule, was co uh, basically conservative farmers. And then you end up mm. with Eamon de Valera, who is, you know, pretty much a, a figure of the right. Yes. You know, I mean, you unequivocally yeah, so. neutral towards Nazi Germany. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, I was, yes, to put it mildly. No, but I mean, I'm talking about his own domestic policies. No, I know. I mean, he's, you know, very, very uh, ultra conservative. Mm. Um, so it's fascinating. Yeah, we'll, we'll watch this space. I think, uh, you know, uh, it would be better if we had a, a more sensible <laughs> national policy. Well, bringing bringing these bringing it, um, the conversation then to to these shores uh, at your recent conference, to which um, you were kind <coughs> enough to invite me, and I enjoyed it a great deal actually. Uh, you you announced that the SDP had received a one million ba uh, pound backing from a donor. Uh, mm. like what is your five-year plan to invoke an ominous phrase for, for, for growing the party? And, I think um, we've we just got to continue doing what we're doing. It's, it's, I, 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 I've never, I've always been realistic with my membership. I've never been, mm. uh, you know, sort of um, hyperbolic and, you know, prepare for government. We, we do have, <laughs> in the, because uh, for, for, it was a phrase in the, in the 80s, that yes, we do yes. have an in-joke in the SDP, prepare for government, which we say a lot, <laughs> uh, but just for fun. But, uh, but realistically, it is, it's, it's deadly serious, believe the project, in that we, you know, if your expectations are reasonable, you, mm. will, you will not be disappointed. And, and actually, we're pretty much on track. And I, I, I've said there are four examples of parties uh, you know, coming up from, from the grassroots up mm. and, and, and succeeding. And uh, we're lots of failures, but the four that have happened, we're, you know, which is Labour, 1902 to 1920, took 20 years to get in government, post-war Liberals, about 20 years to get them back on <coughs> the national scene. Mm. The Ecology Party in the 70s became the Green Party. It's a national party, it's not a huge, you know, but it is a national party. UKIP, a little bit easier because it's a single issue, mm. not full spectrum. But it takes about 20 years, roughly. I think we can do it quicker. I mean, you know, 15 is reasonable. I think 2030 is going to be quite exciting for this party. And uh, to up to date, you know, to now, it's going exactly to plan. So we, had, you know, we in the 80s, the party was a massive party, polling massive, mm -hmm. uh, poll, polling, and a lot of you know millions of votes. But it started at the top and it worked its way down. We're, we're doing the opposite. Yes. Um, and you know. I'm very optimistic. I think we, you know, 120 candidates is now the question. Yes. Party election broadcast, and anyone looking back on that will say, "Well, SDP is the fastest growing party in the country." Yes, which mm. it is. So, okay, this is a semi-international question. Um, <laughs> semi. Um, so across the continent, mm. European continent, we're seeing tons of these like new startup parties yes. around. Let's say like five, ten years, some a little bit longer, mm. getting to like fifteen percent, twenty-five percent. Most of them wouldn't be uh, like conservative liberals; they'd be like conservative conservatives. Mm. Um, and obviously, they've got PR, whereas mm. it's first past the post in the UK. But do you think that there's anything that you could learn from from these parties who are having these like massive upswings? Uh, or that the SDP could gain from their strategies? We, uh, well, I think I, I certainly, te uh, technique, yes, certainly. We, we, we look at a lot of them and, uh, and try and, you know. Um, imitate what works. Imitate what works. Can you name any? Uh, well, I mean, to give you an obvious, we wouldn't, I mean, we're in a separate bracket in, in political terms, but just the, the, the length of the Vox Party in Spain, mm -hmm. for instance their social media was revolutionized by having five second, 10 second bites. Mm. You know, so you know, we, one of the things we try and do is just, just to shorten everything. And, and that worked. I know our politics is different, but you've got to look at it technically and say, well, that, that was very, very effective. Uh, um, at, I'm not talking about the political, because the first thing you do when you're building a party is the, polit the politicos know you, SW1 knows you. Uh, but the mainstream doesn't, you know, the mainstream, you know, tw Twitter knows you, but, but Facebook doesn't. So. That's the real challenge, and mm. Vox got got round that by having these these very very short cl clippy things. But actually, our, our and we so we're aware of of the uh, of the revolution in Europe, and it is a ratchet. It's a rotation. People, mm. <coughs> are, uh, uh, sort of slight dim dim people, don't understand what's going on. It's they think it's some sort of uh, pendulum. Pen, yeah, yeah, swing. To, no, it's not. It's a it's a cultural uh, reaction to what's happening. It's inevitable if you if you have ultra liberal runaway liberalism, you'll get this, and you're going to get this from any mm -hmm. population, because the populations want security. That's mm. basically what you you're seeing. Uh, so we're observing that. But the, the the sort of true model for us really is is the social democratic parties that have got it, mm. the established social democratic parties that get it, uh, uh, and there are one or two. The Portuguese uh, SPD isn't bad, but the best one of all is the Danish one that's in government. 
uh, and they did the turn. They they did the red wall turn. Yes. They did this ten years ago. Realized immigration was a problem. First left wing, mainstream left wing, uh, social democratic party to do it, and of course they're in power. And all the others didn't do it. They're out of power. Mm. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 so. Simultaneously, what is this strange <coughs> reversion to the noughties and early two thousand uh, early two thousand and tens that we're experiencing? In this country, with sort of all of a sudden, Cameron and Hunt are, are in government again. It's almost as though the liberal establishment of the Tory Party is doing everything it possibly can to alienate the coalition which brought it to power uh, with its largest vote share since mm. in 2019, uh, largest vote share since 1987. Like, quite apart from what we think of this ideologically, and I expect we mm. all have a pretty dim view of this ideologically, strategically, and electorally, what on earth do you think Sunak is trying to do? But, but well, by you mean there's ideology there? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that as well. It's pretty content. No, I don't know. I, I think I think I think in I think John Gray got this right. I think Cameron's reintroduction and so on. It's just exhaustion. This is an exhausted uh, political entity that doesn't have any ideas. And you know, and it may be just as as basic as as uh, Sunak, who's basically a newbie, who's only twenty fifteen elected, and mm. uh, wanted someone there to help him. It's a terrible move. I mean, disastrous um, prime minister made a lot of mistakes, Cameron. And his type of politics was, I mean, the worst. My biggest criticism of the of the way the two big parties have reacted in the post Thatcher era is that. They've given up, they've been opportunistic, they've given up on some of the good core things that they used to believe in on both sides. So you had, you know, you know over a decade, well over a decade of new labor, didn't build any council houses, didn't do anything for trains or power or any of the basic, didn't do any of that. They which just, which they, they used to believe in. Yeah, which they used to believe in. Yeah. So, so you just became sort of proto Thatcherites, really, with a little bit more spending, which is probably the worst of all worlds. <laughs> Um, and you know, likewise, the the, the Cameron uh, Osborne Tories uh, just couldn't get over their adoration of Blair, and they're just Blair. You know, so more Blair, um, unpatriotic, not conservative in any way. So I think they're they're they're, they're toast, and, and they they probably will get destroyed. And I think they, as a party, I mean, you've had Peter here, and he's right. He's happened to be right about this. Yes. So we we talked about this a lot, actually. <coughs> where it's like the, the Tories deserve to be destroyed, or they're going to be destroyed, but. One of the things I think we, we've never really discussed is like, what does a destroyed Tory party look like the day after election day? Like, what do the actual people that constitute that party go on and do? Do you think? Well, a lot of them would be out of a job for a start. So a lot of them, be, and some high-profile ones could lose their seats. Ian Duncan Smith could lose his seat. Um, so there'll be chaos. There'll be there'll be a new leader. The depressing thing, from my point of view, is that I'm, I do monitor it and I'm in touch with a lot of them that are like us. But there are not that many that are like us, mm. you know. So from my point of view, I want some of them to get in, and then the day after, when it all and they all they all they're yeah. quite open about it. It's going to oh, hell. Yeah. It's going to break oh, loose. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> It's going to be. You think it's bad now? Uh, oh my word! It's going to be astonishing. So I'm. I hope that one or two come to us. Uh, I don't. I, I've never been. The SCB has never been an open door. Roll the doormat out for people that don't believe in our. Our stuff. I, mean, I, I say the same with voters. I, you don't believe in us. If you don't agree with what we're saying, don't vote for us. Vote mm. for someone else. Um, no point in doing it if you're if you're sort of malleable. Oh, yeah, you know. So I, I think one or two we might get one or two possibly, but it'll be it'll be mayhem. Uh, I think Labour Party and government will be worse than Tories because mm. they have none. They're not going to do anything on the left side that would please us. Mm-hmm. All of that's off the agenda, and but you get this awful. You, they'll, you know, Race Equality Act, just mm. yeah, racial favoritism, mm. all the diversity stuff will be make set people against each other. So, uh, you know, later on this decade, it could be quite interesting. Yeah. Yes, but there's this. I mean, there, there, there is this. Evan and I basically, I think, agree on this that there is this case to be made <coughs> that perhaps, you know, five years of being stabbed in the front by Labour yeah. will be more radicalising than being slowly euthanised by, the, by, say, by yeah. the Tories. And because that's where I feel the conservative movement is at the moment, and that's why I think, of it. For, for now, the thing that we should be trying to do as a, as a sort of broad, mm. socially and culturally conservative movement is preparing exactly for what Evan says, preparing for that day after the defeat, so that we can uh, define the narrative. And I don't, when I when I say that, I don't mean with sort of shameless propaganda. I mean with what we believe to be the truth about the fact that the Conservative Party has lost, not be, in spite of being. Um, uh, ultra liberal and pathetic and cowardly and pinko, but because mm. they were those things. Obviously, yes. No, they, that's right. I mean, they don't. There is, there is a, there is a, uh, 
Yeah, you obviously, that's, he's, he's using that term as a sort of old... Can you say that here? No, 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 no. It's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's, it's you, obviously mean, you obviously mean Pink Tories. Yeah, yeah. Pink Tories. Pink Tories, that's yeah. what it means. So something yeah. different, yeah. Don't worry, it's all right. <laughs> I don't think you can say that in America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, um, Pink Tories, yeah. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it could be quite invigorating because you'll, you'll remove the mask, this pretense that you have conservatives in government or in power. Mm. Uh, and and it could be, it'll be a very interesting time. And I think, I mean, certainly electorally for us in the north, the SDP in the north, we've won very big city council seats off the Labour mm. Party when they're the opposition, mm. when they're in government and they're at some yeah. minus 20 in the polls. I would imagine, well, I know it'll be a lot, a lot more straightforward. So I think uh, for someone with a conservative mindset, uh, when you're regenerated, it'd be good fun. Mm. Yeah. So let's okay. Let's pose a hypothetical here. Let's say a miracle happens, mm-hmm. and you know election day comes and goes, and it's not Labour and it's mm. not the Tories. It's the SDP. Mm. You guys take power. Yeah. A year after that, what is a person's you know day to day life? How does that look different now that the SDP has had the reins for a full three hundred and sixty five days? What do they actually notice? Good question. Uh, the the if we had a massive majority, we would sort the migrant crisis out very very quickly. What does that mean? That means emergency legislation to get out of the post-war protocols. You don't have to, you can just ignore them, but you, you get out of them. Uh, you know, so you, you, you uh, build facilities off, offshore on your own uh, British overseas territories. Uh, fettering the policy to a, a third country is ludicrous. I actually don't believe they were ever serious mm. about Rwanda. I think it's just literally a publicity stunt from, from start to finish. Uh, they've done nothing. Um, it, as soon as you start collecting people that arrive illegally, and uh, shipping them to Ascension, it stops. It stops overnight. No one at all is going to spend 5,000 euros to be taken to Ascension and then to go to a third country. It's going to stop. So uh, you can do it if you want to do it. That, that's one example. What um, do you do about illegal immigrants who are already here? Well, the, you've got to... Send them off as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do you, yeah. Do they if you, yeah, obviously. Well, there's no point. There's no. The, oh, yeah, you might have a different route for that because most illegals would be know where they're from. Mm. But there's no enforcement of this at all. So that these, you know, for a start, you'd st- you'd start saving part of the eight million quid a day they're putting uh, people up in hospitals, uh, hospitals and, and hotels, and you'd also stop the public resentment mm. that goes with having an open border. And as soon as you turn, as, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of depression and gloom and doom because nothing is done and as soon as you have a, a, a government that's prepared to actually act mm-hmm. and do it the whole thing uh, changes i'm not saying it would be easy at all there'd be mm-hmm. a lot of cultural pressure against that but th- that's that's one thing they would notice Can i say one very quick thing um yeah. would there not would there be a double-pronged part of the strategy that there would be a credible deterrent in the form of you're not going to end up you know on the black uh, operating in the black market in britain you're going to end up in the essential on in the essential island so it's a complete waste of money so there's that deterrent effect yeah but, but is there anything that we would do in the channel to turn boats away turn boats back in an australian fashion i don't think you need to i mean I, a lot of i mean uh, you know that's, ref- what, ben Habib, that's you, what ben habib said i know ben, was, ben he, says that they've here. always said that you know and, and richard said that uh, richard tyson said that as well from the start i think the i i've said that and i've said this to richard that i think the pushback policy doesn't survive the first capsized boat, uh, in, in my opinion. But I don't think it's necessary anyway, because if you, at the moment, people sort of wander in, no, it's the military who pick them up, take them to Bryce Norton and ship them to Ascension Island. As soon as it starts, the flow stops. It does, it, honestly, it stops. It stops completely, and no one is going to spend 5,000 euros to, to go to Ascension for up to several years if necessary, and then go to Rwanda mm. or back to. A, the origin country, they're just not going to do that. To, to, to get semi-Singaporean about this, like mm. what, I, what, I, I had a friend, I have a friend, a very close friend, who, sa- who suggests that it might not be the worst idea in the world to uh, send SAS squadrons to assassinate mm. um, people smugglers on the coast of France. People, people, have, sa- people have said this, yeah, I, I don't think that's necessary. No. You don't need to, no, a lot of these ideas, I, I honestly don't, I mean, when we made our policy, we took uh, advice from uh, barristers, we, we, we got the law right from the start. What could we do? And, and again, the reason we preferred a, a British overseas territory is you have total control of it. Indeed. And you, you know, as soon as you start doing that, it stops. It, it does stop. Um, you've got to want to do it. That's mm. the problem. What, what is the? Uh, sorry, I keep going back to international things here. Mm. Um, but right. what is the the SDP's sort of policy or, or view on the war in Ukraine and mm. the war with Israel and Palestine? Well, it's two massive things there. So Ukraine <laughs> first. Ukraine first. Um, we took. 
I mean, it, you know, we're, we're nation state Democrats, so any nation that suffers an invasion of that kind, you've got a, a, a war of uh, national survival, so you, we support Ukraine's uh, right and uh, endeavors in trying to protect itself in, the, in those terms. Um, so we condemned, obviously condemned the, the invasion. However, we were, from the very start, I think we were one of the few political parties to do so, we were realistic about the, I thought, um, unrealistic, unrealistic view in the West that we will apply sanctions and Russia will do what we say because we apply sanctions and we have, and, and, and they, it didn't occur to the political class, and it's a reflection of the political class in the West, in the EU and, and our own political class, Liz Truss was, 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 was responsible really. Uh, 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 it didn't seem to occur to them that Russia is a full spectrum commodity superpower. Uh, it pro produces commodities right across the spectrum. It's not just the oil and gas, it's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the commodities, it, okay, the, the gas supplied to the West is pipeline gas, a lot of it. But oil is a fungible asset and is sold elsewhere. So we flagged up, you can look it up on our website, we flagged up at the very, we condemned the invasion, but we pointed out that if you're going to start putting massive sanctions on, don't be surprised if counter sanctions appear mm. and start affecting you uh, greatly. Now, if you, if you aggregate the total economic loss of the sanctions from the EU and the West to Russia and vice versa, the economic loss in the West has been far bigger. We had more to lose. German, Germany has stopped growing uh, its entire uh, uh, modus operandi as an industrial economy has been removed overnight. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's in a process of deindustrialization, de which is very, very serious. Uh, and I, I don't think Western, pa Western governments uh, took that seriously at all from the start. And um, I, if you ask me what I think will happen, again, realistic hat on here, not what is not is, is ought thing, it oughtn't to happen, but I think what will happen is that I think Russia will partition it eventually. It already has partitioned the country and again, it's, it's something that Western governments are going to find very difficult to, to accept. But I don't believe that Russia will be beaten militarily by Ukraine. And, uh, <laughs> That's probably know, a pretty yeah, so <laughs> safe it's, call. Safe call. But it's not, but that, but that is surprising because that is, I'm just saying something that so few, early on, so mm. few British politicians were, they're talking about total victory. I mean, Boris Johnson running with total victory, mm. total victory in, in Crimea as well. Yeah, I mean, it, you'd want that. That's desirable. A nation state's been attacked. If you're a nation state Democrat, you, you've got to want that. But do you think that's at all realistic? Do you honestly think? Mm. And do you want to do politics in a in a, a bubble of, of, of what you want? Yeah. Or what will real? What is really the yes. case? And mm. what's really the case is Europe's deindustrializing, and people are getting killed, and it's a it's a meat grinder. Do you want that to go on for twenty years or ten years? Could do, and. I'm afraid partition is, is, is a terrible thing, but it's very common. Ireland, mm. Cyprus, Germany, Korea, Vietnam. This is, this yeah. is often how wars are stopped. It goes to, sh it goes to show how the, having a, a, a sort of morally uncompromising, idealistic liberal outlook can actually result in more bloodshed than, oh, yes. than, 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 the, than the most cynical rail politique. I mean, oh, yes. One of my favorite quotes by the historian H.P. Taylor is when he said, in the 20th century, idealists killed many more people than cynics did. Of course. And jo yes. Boris Johnson was possessed of that kind of idealism. He, kind mm. of, he was looking forward to having his Churchillian moment. He's written a book about Churchill. I'm sure that yeah. was going right mm -hmm. through his veins when yeah. he was having those meetings with Zelensky. That was well, dark as hour. He's done mm. exactly all that sort mm. of thing. And then, but, uh, but by all accounts, and I don't think this is completely confirmed yet, but it wouldn't surprise me given Johnson's fa fanaticism on this question, he actually um, torpedoed talks that were taking place in Istanbul in March of 2022, saying that uh, apparently the, the, the Russians and the Ukrainians were speaking and the Russians said, look, in exchange for neutrality, because mm. we regard this as a, ge a geopolitically mm. very important zone, in exchange for neutrality, we will, I, I don't know, there was going to be some kind of peace agreement, which would have looked ugly in mm. liberal, to idealistic terms, mm. but it would have been better than the scenario that you just but described. I don't, I, yeah, I mean, if people bring that up, but I don't believe he had the authority to do that because I still think I'm being cynical now. But the I think you know Johnson was was acting for the United States and would do. I think mm, the I idea agree. that the idea that he would he would have authority to to be uh, a significant um, uh, intervener in that mm. situation at that time is not realistic. But what does that say about British sovereignty that the PM is acting on behalf of the US? Well, it's not there. I mean, it, you know, you look at the, I mean, I, 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 again, I'm on record as being, 
massive, massive critic of the wars of choice and intervention in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, utterly disastrous, crazy, uh, and demonstrably so. I, I, I remember at the time, you know, um, criticizing them vehemently when they, particularly Iraq, uh, the invasion, and, and uh, uh, was probably in a minority in my, my sort of group in doing so. Mm. This is crazy, literally insane uh, to do this, to try and, and, the, and a project to try and impose a sort of Dutch style liberal democracy in, <laughs> in, in <laughs> Afghanistan. Let's build, let's build Amsterdam in, in, in Kabul. Yeah. Yes. What were these people, no, the, so the policy makers are so, a couple of coffee shops. Yeah, so the, 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 this, is, this is risible utter nonsense wasting uh, not only billions of dollars and, and pounds but many, you know lo- I mean the Lancet estimate of excess death in Iraq was 650 I think yeah. mm-hmm. but e- there are estimates that are above a million this is crazy this yeah. is utterly crazy so I I've been against that and I think you know but uh, but unfortunately British policy you know all British prime ministers are sort of in tow the first thing the, the last prime minister tells the next prime minister is to hang close to the, you know hug the Americans close and yeah we're, we're like uh, you know as, as people have said a sort of you know a, a sort of part of an empire an outpost of an empire that does what it's told the the number of cases where British prime ministers don't do that is quite rare one of is not a hero political hero of mine but Harold Wilson uh, gets a tick for this you know he, what did he do he re- well Lyndon Johnson was was getting sucked into the Vietnam War uh, you know again oh, right, it yeah. just it was escalating escalating he put a huge amount of pressure on the Kiwis went in the Australians agreed to go in massive pressure on the British to to intervene because they were there they had bases in, in East mm-hmm. Asia refused Wilson refused 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 and if you read I've got a book on the correspondence between LBJ and Wilson mm. and you won't get more pressure than he was put under and he told him to get lost um, funny later on there were conspiracy theories about uh, Wilson being an, uh, an agent for the Russians <laughs> but that that's complete <laughs> nonsense Didn't doubt that. Yeah, yeah so you pay a price <laughs> uh, that old American trick um, so what does kind of removing Britain from the Empire look like just you know, if, if you were to be come in and become PM, just call up the Americans, be like, no more special relationship, like, no, I, we're, I, we're, we're setting off on our own? There isn't a special relationship, in a sense. Uh, the, the, there isn't, it, it's never been as important to, uh, to them as it is to us. Uh, yeah, I'd never think, heard of it until I came here. No, you won't, you won't hear about it. <laughs> no, I, I won't, I think there is such a thing. I'm not, I'm not a, you know, I'm not sort of, I mean, you know. You're saying case by case basis, on case nas- by case, yeah, and, and they're, they're, you know, there, there, are, there are cultural, massive cultural mm. uh, and, and historic ties and political ties mm. and, you, you know, in the Anglosphere there is. Um, and, and, you know, you've got the five eyes and, and the other s- the structures which exist. I'm not, mm. I'm not, you know, I'm not a sort of leave NATO mm. uh, person at all, but I think British policy should be much more, uh, have a domestic focus to a far greater extent than it has. Mm-hmm. And if you look at what we do and buy, for instance, we have, hardly have an army now, you know, 80,000 people. Uh, the naval procurement has been a, just a disaster. I mean, you've got two aircraft carriers, you don't have... Um, aircraft fully to support those aircraft carriers you don't have a, a strike you don't have a, have a, a, a task force of, of mm. naval vessels to, to have both of these things mm. and and what is it for what mm. are these two things for now a rational uh policy for naval procurement would would, would look at submarines mm. for this country that's what it would do but it doesn't because it wants to project this ludicrous you know we're you know east of Suez or whatever you know mm. it, it, it's ludicrous so i, I the, the United Kingdom needs to get real, get serious, and, and attend to its own affairs. Mm. Have a greater domestic focus. I, you know, we obviously want very, very close um, relations with our, our friends. But doing the bidding of the Americans, sometimes the Americans have to be told no. You often, do. I would say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> More than often. Mm. Uh, f- f- last question, because we're running out of time. Alas, um, Peter Hitchens has said before that if he had to describe his philosophy his political philosophy in one word, it would be British Gaulism. Mm. Uh, and it's, given the, this, the, what we're talking about now, like yes. the, for the French are certainly happy to say, you know, off you go to the Americans yes. when they need to. Do you th- and so, but broadening that out, what Gaulism means in a broader sense, rather than just vis-a-vis the Americans, mm. would, you, would that accurately describe what you're about as well? Yeah, no, it's one of the, one of the terms that I, I've, I've readily accepted. It. Uh, that's what the SDP is. It's, a, you know, it's not autarky, but it's a slightly more domestic focus in all mm-hmm. uh, public policy, a preparedness to tread your own path occasionally Gosh. Uh, to have you know to have a, a sense of nationhood and nation and us uh, and, and bring people together 
And I think, uh, yeah, he, uh, Peter um, describes it brilliantly. Well, listen, William, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. you on Deprogrammed. Thank you pleasure so much. Here. Evan, thanks as ever. Thank you. You've been watching Deprogrammed. Make sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment if you wish, and we shall see you on the next one. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.